There's a lot of talk about the German Bishops' Conference, and they're taking after Pastor Jimmy Martin of the Jesuit Church on all manner of things. Here in the States, the Jesuit preacher takes to his favorite pulpit, Twitter, to preach his support of the bishops of Germany and all their innovations. And as I am convinced that Pastor Jimmy will soon enough find himself Bishop Jimmy, we can rest assured that Jimmy is rarely on the wrong side of things going on in the church, at least in a material sense, and that in the long run, what he wants usually comes to pass. While many in the church today wonder if Germany will soon go its own way ecclesiastically, it is worth noting that the real central discussion point isn't Pastor Jimmy and his personal mission of bridge building at all, but rather the central point of discussion is sharing the Eucharist with virtually anyone who wants it. That is the central point of discussion, and frankly, what the German bishops want is only the next logical step that builds on the work of the previous two pontificates after the Second Vatican Council, but the question of schism looms. Bishop Botzing, the German prelate who has somehow been informally crowned as the head of the German bishops' conference, has said that the church in Germany is not in schism. Okay, then. Cardinal Burke disagrees, actually. I've got a link to a story about this in my show notes. This is, of course, you know, Batzing's point is despite the German prelates moving forward with not adhering to the recent CDF ruling and, pr and providing the clerical blessing and rejection of the CDF ruling. And that at least spoken words of Francis for what that's worth. You know, Francis has come out a few times and said no, but, you know, <laughs> you know how that works. Whether the authorities in Rome will make a move after this is anyone's guess, but if they do not, then the German bishops' conference and their clergy will serve as a positive example for the rest of the prelates in the church who share their sentiment on the Pastor Jimmy Martin topic in the church, a positive example in their own minds, anyway, and I'd assume in the minds of the demons of the pit. But at the heart of this isn't that, but something that the Vatican previously embraced decades ago, and that is the sharing of the Eucharist with the acolytes of Luther and Calvin and Zwingli under, and Henry under certain conditions. This was done in an encyclical back in the 80s or 90s, and since then has been expanded on in practice, now to the point where the bishops of Germany just want to expand it completely. Mueller speaks to what is central to this larger central error we see not only in Germany, but in many places. The Cardinal Mueller... Cardinal Gerhard Mueller specifically, one that, and this issue is one that Francis is only repeating, that was made by his two predecessors specifically, and Francis is just really running wild with it, that is, again, of the sharing of the Eucharist, with the acolytes of Zwingli and Luther in some cases. The cause of the break in Christianity in the 16th century is over a misunderstanding of what the Church teaches when it comes to works and the sacrifice of the altar and the nature of grace. Quote, according to Mueller, the unity of Western Christianity broke down precisely on the question of the Holy Mass as a sacrifice. Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin did not totally reject only some overreaches regarding the Holy Mass, but rather the core of the Eucharist of the, Holy, of the Catholic Church, from which they themselves came, as being corrupted by the focus of works. The consequence was that from the previous liturgy of the Mass, only the communion part remained. The high prayer with the Holy Consecration was ended because the sacrifice of the Church was interpreted as an addition or even a repetition of the one sacrifice of Christ on the cross, and therefore it had to be rejected. Today we try to better understand the ecumenical partner starting from his positive concerns and avoiding any major point of difference. This has nothing to do with hiding the serious differences in the understanding of the church and the sacraments, which make a common communion or reception of communion with our separated brethren impossible from within. Only those who make the foundation of Christ a kind of ritual or interior communion see no problems. But a Christianity that has renounced the claim to truth of supernatural revelation and has reduced itself to worldly works and religious sentimentality, that is, that legitimizes only itself only in an interior way, will only make a fool of itself before a secularized public. Then it doesn't even need to cry about its own self-made irrelevance. End quote. Only those who make the foundation of Christ a kind of ritual interior communion see no problems and won't need to cry about their own self-made irrelevance. That is a good line, and it is at much of the heart of modernism. Interior communion, that is, the sharing of a sentiment of communion, the sharing of a vague idea of what it means to follow Christ, one that overlooks all the rather large looming points of debate between the followers of Peter and Christ and those who follow Luther and Calvin and Henry. For many, it does not matter that the Church teaches that Holy Communion, that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ truly present. And in teaching, 
that is repeating what our Lord said in sacred scripture. Further, that what our Lord says of those who don't consume the same real presence in the Eucharist is repeated by the church. For the men in the church, it doesn't really matter because a vague sentiment of communion, communion under a label of Christian rather than under the sacrifice of the altar and under the keys of Peter, has replaced any notion of authentic communion. Central to this thinking is the idea that theology doesn't matter. Well, at least between the acolytes of Luther and the rest of us and the modernists, remember that because theology between the mainline modernists and traditional Catholics certainly does, as I've covered numerous times on this channel. But let's continue. Mueller goes on and speaks to what conditions these days a Catholic priest may give communion to someone not in communion with the Church. He also goes into what the Church teaches about the Eucharist in this specific kind of case, that of sharing communion with the acolytes of Luther and the rest. Much of the focus has been on Pastor Jimmy topic in Germany, but the Eucharist is actually the keystone to all of this. Quote, Anyone who has not entered in communion of the Church through holy baptism has nothing to do with the Eucharist. Whoever has not taken the first step cannot have reached the goal. Based on the assumptions of the Catholic understanding of the Church and the Eucharist, the spiritual assistance of non-Catholic clergy is possible only in special cases. It is appropriate when the salvation of the soul is in mortal danger and cler clergy of one's own denomination is not available. This can be absolution in the context of confession and the reception of Holy Communion if the person concerned affirms and confesses the Catholic faith in these two sacraments interiorly. The Eucharist as a liturgical celebration is the sacrament, that is, the sign, reality, which makes present the sacrifice of the life of Christ and his resurrection for all who in subsequent generations come to believe in Christ through the word of the Annunciation. Because Christ is the Lord truly present in the church for all times, he himself is in the Mass the same sacrificial priest and the same sacrificial offering, in which on the cross he consummated and revealed his union with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Those who govern the church, such as bishops and presbyters, are enabled by ordination and the Holy Spirit to carry out the liturgical and spiritual ministry that Jesus carries out through them in real terms. That is why they are called priests, which means nothing more than presbyters, with no ancient pre-Catholic understanding of theology. Because priests do not fulfill on their own initiative, but solely on behalf of Christ at the liturgical sacramental level, what Christ, the high priest of the new covenant, does for the church. We as believers are not passively watching like silent spectators at a play, but are involved as members of the body of Christ, actually offering our life sacrifice in, with, and through Christ as our head, God the Father, from whom, after all, we have already received everything we can offer to him in advance. St. Augustine, in the tenth book of his City of God, profoundly exposes this connection between the unique sacrifice of the cross and its making itself present in the liturgy of the church. Without knowledge of this text, dialogue with the acolytes of Luther and Calvin is nothing but hot air. And mostly, quote. And there are plenty of people who don't understand this. The commonly accepted notion that we see is that because we all profess Christ that we should be able to share the sacrament of the altar. Even Mueller goes into that himself to a degree. He accepts the innovation that really took root after Vatican II of having common prayers and attending the various services of these same acolytes and the rest, something the church did not embrace it all before the council, but actually taught that it was a sin to do so. And sadly, he doesn't see the link between this innovation and our present discussion of how we found ourselves in the place of sharing the Eucharist with those who do not profess the real presence of Christ in the sacrament in the first place. This was not something that was even open to discussion throughout the history of the Church. The Church Fathers, including St. Ignatius of Antioch, all the way back in the late 1st and early 2nd centuries, had some rather choice words for those who did not profess the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Like so many other things in the Church today, the better voices often miss the point entirely. But Mueller does have this to say that is worthy of our attention. Mueller takes a more open approach to the efficacy of what he calls long-distance Mass, meaning watching the Mass on television or in, on an internet live stream. Elsewhere, as I reported a year ago or so, the Auxiliary Bishop of Kazakhstan reminded us that the bishops do not possess the power to tell the faithful as a whole not to attend Mass, or to give a dispensation from your Sunday Mass obligation. They simply cannot do that on such a scale. Mueller speaks to this some and calls the idea of long-distance consecration of the Eucharist an absurdity. Quote, a long-distance consecration is an absurdity in a sacramental theological overreach. What matters is bodily presence. 
However, if Christ were truly, really, and essentially present only in the faith of those who receive him, and not in the Eucharistic gifts, then the image on television would be a virtual reassurance, which is mentally effective, but not sacramentally effective. Christ truly expired with flesh and blood on the cross, and not just for appearances, as the, the docetists taught. God save us in the age of virtuality, from a sacramental theological docetism in an elegantly reinforced guise. End quote. I guess there's been some discussion about the lady having communion wafers that have not been consecrated and holding them up to the TV screen during a televised mass so that they can be consecrated by the priest. And if that's the case, that shows how far gone things really are in the church these days. Some have asked about receiving sacramental absolution via video conference or on the phone. And the answer is simple. You cannot confess over the phone and receive absolution. The efficacy requires for the priest and layperson to be in person. The same is true with the rest of the sacraments. And I haven't really heard anyone in any serious way make the case for a web consecration of the Eucharist. But if you have, let me know in the comments, please. I'm always curious about these odd developments in this time of changes and innovation. Mueller goes on. In the show notes, I have a link to the full interview if you want to read it. I'm not going to recount it completely, but Mueller does say that he thinks the church in Germany is on the verge of schism, despite what Bishop Botzing says. And here he repeats what Cardinal Burke says. I have both of those stories in my show notes today, as I've said already. Now, many of you likely believe that they, meaning the German bishops, are already there. <laughs> I honestly share that sentiment at this point, but remember, in the spirit of Vatican II, schism only happens if you reject innovation and hold fast to the traditions of the Church. If it's done in the spirit of Vatican II, then very few actions can ever incur the canonical declaration of schism. So, I remain skeptical that the hierarchy will act. But I could be surprised. I just kind of doubt it. Let me know your thoughts on this in the comments, please. And of course, like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell if you don't want to miss an update. It actually really does help. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.